That was great. That was terrific. Uh, now I know I can have some steak because I went to church yesterday. So, so that'll be good stuff. Um, I love this. I want to start by uh, both uh, saying something about Michael Moe. I want to thank Michael Moe for this because this, is, this event is just terrific. And I think that you know, his, we all also know that his focus on education is, goes all the way back to his geography class from when he was a kid. He made this slide himself. And Mike's, um, it's, it's great. It's, uh, it's, we, we can always improve ourselves. I, I, I want to um, uh, bring up our next group panel here. And I promise I'll get you guys at 8. Uh, and if you see me looking at my phone, it's not because I'm checking the score of the game. Uh, but there's a game going on. But uh, um, yes, perfect. <laughs> Rocky music. Get Why not? Um, so uh, I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves, but I want, I want to kind of talk about this. So my name is Corey Johnson. <clears throat> I uh, co-host a show called Bloomberg West and Bloomberg Television, which we launched just about four years ago uh, with a tagline that I made up, uh, which is uh, innovation, technology, and the future of business. Innovation, because it doesn't really mean anything, but everyone thinks it means something. Technology means something. Business means selling stuff for more than it costs. And as, as we've heard this kind of a theme of the business has a different approach to things. So here we have three people who've had ter tremendous success in the world of business, but also in the world of education. And um, I, I'm going to start with you, Tim, last. I'm hoping you'll shake things up a little bit. Uh, um, so Mitch, why don't you introduce yourself and talk about the Caper Center and talk about what you're doing. Of course, you, you speaking of math. Lotus one two three, a creation of yours, and, and uh, uh, that helped me in math. I didn't help me when I got to four, but one two three was a good start. <laughs> so the Cape War Center, which is in Oakland, we do a couple of things. Yes, Oakland, um, the next great tech frontier. Uh, on the investing side, Cape War Capital is a social impact investor in tech startups, seed stage about finding companies in education and other sectors like financial inclusion that are about closing uh, gaps of access and, and opportunity. And then we have our, our Level Playing Field Institute in the center, which runs education programs. It's trying to uh, build the pipeline and fix the leaky pipeline to develop the talent we have in our low-income communities of, of color. So, um, and specifically, <coughs> I, I see you guys building your new, your new building on, uh, on Broadway as I pass it there downtown. But uh, uh, you focus a lot on something you call the gap, which we've heard allusions to. But, but talk to me about sort of how, wh where, where you're trying to spend money, where that focus is. Well, there is clearly all kinds of gaps of, of access and opportunity, not only in education, but in access to credit and, 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 and capital. And I, I think on the one hand, uh, people in the tech business have no trouble intellectually agreeing with that. But on the other hand, at the same time, we tend to hold the belief as a community that we exist already as a perfect meritocracy and that the people you see who are getting funded, the sort of not, you know, very heavily white <coughs> male uh, techie types, are getting funded because they really are the best and the brightest. But particularly in technology. Yeah, particularly in, in technology. And that, that can't possibly be true if talent and genius is really evenly distributed by zip code, which I think was my line. <coughs> so thank you, Michael, for, for passing it on. And opportunity is not. And it's a continual challenge that we make to our colleagues in the tech community to sort of take account and recognize uh, the ways in which being a meritocracy is really more aspirational than it is uh, uh, a fact, and to look at things like all of the fabulous scientific research on hidden or implicit or unconscious bias uh, that takes place when uh, in our ideas about, well, what kind of person is it that is likely, for instance, to be a successful entrepreneur when we're writing, uh, writing those checks. Um, and we all carry around, the, the, it's the imprint of the culture uh, on, our, on, on our minds is we tend to think that uh, successful entrepreneurs are probably going to look more like Z Mark Zuckerberg than not. And unless we do something to sort of recognize and mitigate those biases, we're going to continue to reproduce the kinds of privilege that we have now. But the good news is there are all kinds of things that we can do. We're very malleable and we're very smart as a species. So if we have the will and the right perspective, we can actually transform things. So let me I'm going to stick with you just to follow up on that just a little bit deeper. Therefore, because I think most everyone here agrees with that, where, do we put our, where are you putting money to fix a couple pieces of that? 
Give me one example. So, you know, there is actually no shortage of places to go look, but I think part of our view is that, as and this is common in, uh, in, in the tech community, entrepreneurs tend to scratch their own itch. The problems that they have encountered become opportunities for them to solve them. If you are working with entrepreneurs who have a different life experience and different problems, they're going to come up with different solutions. So for instance, uh, Frederick Hudson, who was just in the most recent Y Combinator class, has a company called Pigeonly that is bringing uh, uh, services to the incarcerated. They're reducing uh, the cost of phone calls from uh, dollars a minute to, to cents a minute, and that's just the beginning. He came by this because he had a lot of time to think about it when he was doing time himself uh, for being a very effective distributor of marijuana at a time when it was not yet legal. But I guarantee that um, you know, he is not, if you were just to look at him and his <coughs> resume, he's not going to pop to the top of the list, but an incredibly uh, motivated and successful entrepreneur. So we have to look more broadly. Bailey Ibrahim, I, uh, I think that your, um, your operating partner, Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers, leading venture capital firm, it's no Draper Fisher Jurvinson, but it's, it's good, uh, uh, and has had great successes. And when John Doerr came uh, to meet with the Bloomberg staff in an off-the-record meeting, and I don't think John would mind that I share this part of it was off the record, what he talked about probably the most was Coursera. And as, as Mike was pointing out earlier, Coursera really is changing things. Describe to me where Coursera is in its existence and how many people you're serving and so on. Uh, um, that, happy to do so, and probably is worth just mentioning that um, I was involved with Coursera from the very first time the two founders walked in the door at Kleiner Perkins. Still not sure whether they actually wanted to form a company. So from then until now, where I'm the chief business officer. Um, and Cor I think Coursera has like th this tremendous opportunity ahead of like what we're trying to do for the world. You can imagine the challenge and the challenges and the opportunity of providing universal access to the world's top education. Uh, we've been in existence for just about three years. We have over 12 million learners, around 1,000 courses, and we've had um, o over, we've had uh, 37,000 years of videos that have been watched. 37,000 years of videos. <clears throat> yes. God, that's like watching CNBC for like three days. <laughs> um, but it's, and it's not that's just about that. It's actually about the credential and how we're rethinking. I think Michael mentioned it earlier, too, of everything from the uh, challenges in the workforce of reskilling and upskilling to closing the education gap around the world. So we're starting to see this uh, great impact and opportunity where we've really transitioned from can you have classes online to now you can, how do you make it more meaningful and relevant, and do it in a way that is global from the start. I love that, this, that, that the idea of Coursera puts uh, right to the test uh, the, 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 the higher education um, uh, conundrum of truly believing in education and educating the masses and really screwing up the business model of these universities and, and the point of tuition. Like absolutely like calls, calls it, uh, and so what is, uh, when you look at Coursera as a business, which does it not completely uh, uh, turn over the apple cart of the, the higher education business and how do you convince uh, colleges and universities to give it away when they're trying to convince people to pay for it? Well, it's interesting because I think when we first started, that was actually the concern that everyone had was, uh, you know, the universities were interested in participating. They didn't want to be left behind and jump onto the MOOC revolution, so they were very much experimenting on the platform. But I think what's happened in the past three years is they're actually doing, they've seen a few things. If you do a data a search on data science uh, on Google, Johns Hopkins class will pop up in the top. That's something that as a university, they would have never, first of all, to have the chance to have that type of branding with an emerging field, and then to have that type of search engine optimization and to be called out. So that's, a, um, that's one benefit that universities are seeing. They're also seeing an uptick in their revenue. So there's a lot of the universities where a year ago we were very much, they were still in experimental mode, are now thinking about how do I experiment around new revenue models and adjacent business line of having courses online, and then using that as a feeder program to our on-campus or continuing education. So we have a lot of universities who are really leaning into that. And then also the brand and um, the learner reach. Uh, we have 
we have a global reach, as I mentioned. We're global from the start, and what does that mean? It means that 75% of our learners are outside of the United States. It means that 60% of our business, our actual revenue, is coming from outside of the United States. And that's a way that a lot of the top universities, at least in the United States, haven't had that type of reach in the past. Although we see that more and more. Um, I want to get back to the issue of demographics, but I want to start with you, Tim. So um, uh, Draper University is what? Draper University is a school that I created uh, because I thought something was missing in education. And I, um, and I had done a lot of interesting things in education. I started Biz World, which teaches young kids how to, business works. And uh, I was on the state board of education. But your kids are pretty smart. <laughs> I've met your kids. Well, yeah. I'm married well. Um, so, but, but I had this great education, but I thought something's missing, and it's the, it's the doing thing. It's the what happens when you drop the water. Um, and I think what we've done is we've, our education system has gotten too careful and too system, systematic, and they've gotten a little lazy, and, um, and it gets boring. How so? Well, the classroom's still the same thing. It's one teacher lecturing to all those uh, students. But, um, but something that I did was I went, when I started Draper University of Heroes. Um, so I, the Draper University of Heroes? Of Heroes, yeah. Um, Why do you let me get away with calling it Draper University? I will never do that again. I'm going to call it Draper University. <laughs> That's too awesome. So I, I started in, in thinking, um, I went to a lawyer and I said, well, what do I need to do? And he had this litany of things I had to do. And I, oh, you need three professors and we need this and we need this. And, and uh, then to be accredited, da 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 da, da. And th then I, I thought, wait a second, I remembered that Andover and Exeter were not accredited schools. And I thought, well, what if you don't want to be accredited? And then he said, oh, well, then you don't have to do any of this stuff. So I made it a point to go after everything that you had to do to be accredited and do just the opposite. So instead of teaching history, we teach future. And instead of having three full-time professors, we have 50 speakers that come through. And, uh, and then we have things that no school would, you know, with, with any kind of liability issues would do. We have survival training. Um, but but the the thing that the thing that they're, they're, actually they're not actually trying to eliminate other students. Like, no, or, no, or break no, the no. ankles like no, the Nancy Kerrigan approach. As a team, and that gets into right. that gets into our biggest innovation, and that beyond anything else is a team-based approach. We break the class into. This is, by the way, a six-week program, and we do it four times a year, and we have had 40 students at a time. And uh, they, they've come from uh, 42 different countries, and they are 60% international. Um, and we, and it's, it's uh, needs And are the blind. teams set as soon as they walk in the room? Yeah. So what we do is we do like a Harry Potter kind of, uh, you know, sorting hat kind of thing. And then you get, you're in, on this team of five or six people. By the way, we choose five or six because if there are only two, then they don't think they can accomplish anything. And if there are 10, people can hide. So we go six, six people, and five or six people, and each of those teams then is stuck with that group of six people for the entire time. And the grading is all based on team, like the, the honors, everybody kind of passes except for one or two that we throw out. But, um, but it's the, the honor students are the top team. And I had this great conversation with the uh, sheriff of, of uh, the head chief of police of San Mateo. And she said, you know, you're doing some interesting things here. Give us some ideas for what we should be doing. And so she told me about, you know, the, the problems with the youth and how troubled they were and, and what, you could, what could we possibly do. And, and uh, I came up with this idea, and I think we really should do it everywhere. This is really amazing. OK, so I came up with the idea that instead of grades that were all individual-based, you give grades to teams. 
and not just, not just for entrepreneurs, not, not just for these best and the brightest from all over the world who want to go start businesses, but for every school. And, and instead of doing individual, what you say is, you're in a t this team of five, and you are in competition with all the other teams of five in your class, and the top team in your class is going to get an A, and the next team's going to get a B, and the next team's going to get a C, and the next team's going to get a D. And think about what this does for parents. All of a sudden, instead of, Johnny, you got to study, you got to really work hard and make sure you're the, the A student, it's Johnny, bring your team over. We'd like to do some reading. You know, let's do a study group with your team, and then you get this, you know, everyone from the bottom to the top of the class all working together. And Johnny gets smarter because if he was really the A student, he teaches the other kids, and then they all get smarter, but he has to be a teacher. He has to go from being a student to being a teacher, and it just totally blows everything away. And all of a sudden, being a student is no longer this individual, scary, whatever thing. It's like, hey, we're a part of a team, and we've really got to accomplish this mission. You're about to say something. You're about to jump in. No, I, I was just saying it's really exciting to hear that, because I think we're trying to figure out part of the same thing. How do you bring some of those team dynamics and mixing up people that may not traditionally work together? <laughs> Skype. Skype yeah, groups well, and, or, or how Google do you do Hangouts. it on? Yeah, how do you do yeah. it online? Um, suddenly, you have, for example, if you look at our translator community, it's thirty-five thousand people water. working together to try to translate content. If you look at projects, so um, you know, and our one of our top classes is social psychology, and in a single instance of that class is two hundred and sixty thousand people. We're in a classroom at a university; it would be thirty people with a somewhat similar uh, cohort. So now you've got you know, a quarter of a million people around the world taking the same class and learning about what empathy means in their, in their country, in their culture, and sharing it with their peers. And so it's, whether it's Skype or um, essays where you do peer grading and have to grade five other students, learn, you know, you're having a chance to be a part of something that's like bigger than you and having a chance to learn and to contribute. And I think that's really what's transforming in education. It's how do you do more of this at scale? Mitch, you know, it seems my, like, well, oh, 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 go ahead. My, my daughter went to, through my program, and she said, yeah, it was an interesting program, Dad, but I learned the most from the people from the 42 different countries. Do you, so the, it, this is the, right. where you kind of get, um, of course, other students have said, you know, I went to four years at Stanford. And I learned more in this six-week period than I did in my four years at Stanford. So it's really, but there's an and they say, I would never have worked so hard if, I hadn't, if it hadn't been that I was going to let down my team. But, you fa but in the example you gave, 20% of them are going to get an F? Well, in, in my, no, I said D. <laughs> In the, in, that's in My the household, classroom. he was an F. So. Well, we basically, we, we basically have everybody sort of be sort of a graduate, yes. except for one team, and that's the honor. Do we need more failure in education to make students motivated? I, I, I think provocative ideas, and I've, I've learned this from people who are founts of interesting provocative ideas, is find the kernel of what's valuable, which is about really getting people to collaborate with each other and to have a lot of motivation. The details will get worked out so that we don't actually have to fail 20%. That's a later part of the process. So if we get misfocused on the obvious flaws of the first iteration, we're going to miss the chance to really develop the core value. And you know, I've, I've actually learned this from my wife, who has incredibly brilliant ideas, to find the nugget in it. And then you really got to work on it in practice. You got to try it. You got to iterate. You may have to pivot. And so I wouldn't even. I wouldn't worry about that. I would just try to get the basic me mechanics of this thing. Have you done it? Yeah, we do it. We, that's what our school is all about. And we're, we're spreading it. You know, we had a whole group from San Luis Obispo who came, and they are bringing that back to San Luis Obispo, along with the flip classroom, which is another breakthrough, I think. The idea that the, the classroom is where everybody comes to do their homework, and then then they go and then they have their, their discussions afterwards. It's kind of a cool the, idea. The other institution that works that way is the military. And that's the way a lot of the training that works. It's never about you and your achievement. It's about 
you and your unit because that's what it's trying to produce and it's been highly successful in yeah. that. And well, business, who, business is all team based. I don't know why we teach everybody to just sort of be an individual and whatever when you got to, well, when you well, go you out in both, life right? and you need a team. You need, I mean, you need basic skills, whether it's the ability to play a scale and as a musician or the ability to do your times tables as, as and a And that's a, and that's an individual. But that's effort. a very, that's a, that's at the most basic levels, right? So I wonder, but you know, I think about this a lot with my work, you know, talking to innovators, I guess it doesn't mean anything, but people with new ideas, people trying different things. And you know, part of my background, not just as a, as a journalist and investigative journalist, but I was, I was an investor for a while. I focused on finding frauds and finding fakes and finding companies that lied about stuff and knew it. And then I would short those stocks and wait for their, 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 their hard work to be rewarded, which meant that the stocks would collapse and my investors would profit from that. So when I look at things like, when I think about securities regulations, I think, well, Without some certain securities regulations, we've seen what happens, right? We we know what we know when the Securities Act of 1932. It's because of 1928, 29, right? We know uh, why there are laws against Ponzi schemes. It's because of Charles Ponzi. So and and I and yet I marvel at Silicon Valley, and I think of you sort of as one of the leading proponents of this idea that so what we'll have a lot of bad outcomes, we'll have a lot more awesome outcomes. Is that how you think of it? I I do in some ways, but I also see see sort of regulations as as the lazy way out. Um, because I think if you were really creative, you could figure out a, a proper motivation so that people would, do the, would go in the right direction. Um, and, and actually, you talked about the, you know, people doing the, the wrong thing, where the A student's family would be very focused on getting that A student's team to win. The, the D student's family would also have responsibility for that student and would, would share the shame if that D student was acting out or doing something wrong. So, uh, so this whole thing ends up bringing everybody up so that they're all achieving and trying to be the best and the brightest. Well, who are your students? Who are, what, what, what demographic? You talked about distribution, but I, what I would imagine is that, and we talked about this a little bit on the phone, that there are sort of different cohorts that are very different than each other that aren't sort of equally balanced, but represent very different groups. Yeah, uh, let me share it at a high level first, and then I'll, I'll dive in a little bit with uh, some more details. So uh, about half of our learners are career builders. That means they're probably average age around 30. So if you think about it, you're uh, you know, you've been working in the workforce for a while and all of a sudden you realize what you actually really want, wish you had studied or wanted to do. So our early adopters, we have about a, um, half of our learners fall into that category. We also have aspiring students. So students who are enrolled, about 15% are enrolled in some type of institution and that they want to augment or supplement what they're learning on campus. Uh, we have another group of learners that are enrichment learners. Um, they tend to take a lot of coursework in um, topics like uh, the humanities. Uh, education is actually really big because we, we looked at the, the, what they engage with in terms of the content. And those actually range from mid-20s on up. Um, and so they fall into different categories defined by what their intention is once they come to the platform. Uh, in terms of uh, what we're finding geographically is that the age skews younger in developing markets, which, uh, so we have about a third US, a third in developing economies, and a third in developed economies. About 40% of our learners are women currently, uh, which reflects actually the internal composition of the company as well. We try to have a very diverse workforce. Uh, we skew, as I was starting to mention, we skew younger in emerging economies, um, China, India, for example, where it's right around the time of, like they're getting close to graduating from the co traditional college age where they realize if they were fortunate enough to be in university, they probably didn't get all the skills they need for employability. So kind of those two years pre-entering the workforce to the two years post. Um, we think that'll continue. Like our focus right now has been a consumer first model, but we're starting to say, okay, you know, I, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm a chip designer. I was at Intel for 18 years. My engineering skills are way outdated. And so like now that I'm in the workforce and like, okay, I want to take that business class. You know, Wharton is now offering for their basic uh, MBA classes online for $600. I don't need to take two years off 
out of my career to go and engage and to get those skills and the credential that is meaningful for my continued employability. Mitch, who are you, what, what are, the, what are the, the students or the people you're trying to help look like? Um, they actually look much more like the rest of the country than most of us in this room do. So this year, for the first time in uh, K-12 public schools, uh, it is majority people of color. Uh, and that is going to be the shape of the whole uh, country by 2040 or before. That population is historically underserved. Um, so like if you look in the state of California, where is computer science offered? The more white a school is, the greater the chances that computer science courses are offered, and the converse is, is true. We're trying to reach students with high talent in, in STEM uh, who do not have high opportunity. And so we do middle school, we do high school, we do a summer program, we do an academic year program. And it's based on the conviction that if you bring kids together, uh, and the cohort is very important, by the way, for the same reasons, so that they could see that they're not alone, because in their schools, they tend not to get rewarded for being the smart kid, but be punished. Here, they get, they're with other kids like themselves, and their teachers are, uh, are role models. We do not take any of the tests for them or do any of the work. They have to do all of that, but the idea is that they can get the additional uh, academic work, which is very rigorous, and they can get directed on a track in life to go to and succeed at a selective college. And they're 85% free reduced lunch eligible, 85% first in family to go to college. That's the target demographic in our education programs. That is awesome. We are out of time. Um, but I want to thank you. It's, it's, you know, I interview people all day, every day. It is such an honor to be up here with you guys who are really helping change people's lives. And such Good. A fundamental and thank work. you all you guys. This is really exciting to see so many people trying to improve education when the, yeah. um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't do enough to try to improve education. And uh, I'm thrilled that at least this group right on. Is, it feels that it's more important than the big game. <laughs> which, is in the, which is in the third quarter, and it's close. It was tied at the half. It's amazing. But thanks, guys. Thank you. thank you, everybody, and thank you for a great panel. We'll see you guys tomorrow morning, bright and early, if you're not at the piano bar later. But uh, thank you. That was awesome.